You know, somewhere in this 14 years that we've been in this space, there was a particular Sunday I was preaching, and there was a woman that came to the front gate. <clears throat> Some of you may remember this, maybe you don't, but she stood there, and she just scowled at me, and funny enough, the lights are so bright, I can't see you, but I can see the gate. And if I couldn't see it, I could feel her stare. You see, her daughter, who was a high schooler at the time, had been coming to this church for a few weeks. And so at the end of the sermon, as I'm trying to wrap up, I hear her yell, where's the pastor? Kind of obvious, right? He's up on the stage. And so where's that pastor? And I remember saying, look, I'll, I'll come over there in just a minute. And we wrapped up and we prayed and I walked over to talk to her. And very aggressively, she got right in my face and she said, I want to know what your beliefs are about homosexuality. And I said, hi, my name's Pastor Kevin. <laughs> What's your name? And uh, I said, what are your views on homosexuality? And very stunned, she kind of took a breath and she looked at me and she goes, well, I asked you first. And I said, well, I asked you second. And we just stood there kind of in this moment of pause. And she said, my daughter believes she's gay. And she's been kicked out of five churches. And what I want to know is, will this church be number six? That's a serious question, isn't it? Because now we're not talking about sexuality. We're talking about someone's child and whether or not they'll be welcomed into a community, regardless of whatever their background is. And I remember looking at her, and thank God one of my daughters ran by, I think it was Courtney, and I just said, uh, well, see that girl right there? That's my daughter. And your daughter will be treated just like my daughter. That every time she comes in here, people will welcome her with open arms, and that this will become her church home and her community. Because we're okay with the uneasiness of life. That mom looked at me and said, that's acceptable. And she and her daughter came here for months. In fact, until her daughter graduated high school, and then she disappeared and went off to college. And it wouldn't be but another three or four years later, and she would come back with her husband and her new baby. And she would ask us if we would be a community that would welcome her entire family and baptize her daughter. And we did. You see, everyone deserves a church home. And we are so focused on where people are at versus where people are headed. And today we're going to be looking at a particular apostle who's one of my absolute favorites. His name is Peter, which is Petros in Greek. It means rock, which is everything he's not. But instead of calling him what he is, Jesus looks at his future and says, I know what you're going to become. You're going to become a rock. And so I want to take you through a quick history of Peter. And then I want to take you through a short lesson on some Greek words because they're really important for the next story I want to tell you, which is about Peter. And then I want to show you how that story relates to us and where we're headed as a church. So let's pray, and then we're going to begin that journey together. Lord Jesus, as we gather in this space, we truly do believe as a community that everyone deserves a church home. There's not a single soul on this entire earth that ever has been or ever will be that isn't loved deeply by you. And God, I'm so thankful that you don't look at us where we're at, but you look at us as where we're going. That you see through all our flaws and shortcomings and you see the incredible piece of art that we are created by you. Lord, my prayer is that today as we look at Peter, we, we see the messed up mess of scribbles that is his life. And that we begin to look at him with new eyes, your eyes, and we see him as the piece of art that you created him to be. And that in that art, we might find ourselves as treasures, beloved children of the living God, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, oh, Peter, I told you, is one of my favorite apostles because, man, if there's a guy that could get stuff wrong, it's Peter. But the one thing Peter doesn't lack is the desire to want to be better. And he constantly lives his life trying to be better, even though he just can't quite wrap his head around it. So today, if you were to head to the Middle East in Capernaum, you would actually find this set up monument, which sits over one of the first worship places in the area. And many people believe that this actually was Peter's home where he lived and where one of the first churches began. In fact, on the walls, they'll see graffiti almost that depict biblical stories and teaching and scripture. But you can visit that today. All right, let's talk a little bit about Peter. His claim to fame is that Peter goes by three names, Simon, Cephas, or Peter. He walks on water briefly before starting to go under. Remember when Jesus says, come walk to me, and Peter's like, I'm all in, and he steps out, and he walks on the water, but then the moment he looks down and he loses faith, he sinks. That is a great metaphor for G or Peter's life. He talks as much as all the other apostles put together. He's a loudmouth because he's a verbal processor trying to figure things out, and he's not afraid to say stuff. He serves as the primary source of Mark's gospel. 
He writes two remarkable epistles, first and second Peter, and he's crucified upside down by Nero in Rome because by the time he gets to that point in his life, he says, I am not worthy to be crucified the same way as my Lord and Savior. Turn me upside down. The worst betrayals is that Peter denies Jesus Christ three times in one night. He also acts hypocritical while in Antioch. He favors the Jewish population over the Gentiles for a short period of time before he's corrected and he says, I get it, we are all the body of Christ, Jew and Gentile. But it shows you that Peter, even though he is a mature apostle of Jesus, is no different than you and I. Sometimes his desire for his faith is greater than his faith. And that's okay because Jesus sees the incredible potential in this man that he is a child of the living God. The first half of Peter's story is told in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if you want to see Peter in action afterwards, which is the best part, by the way, you can read about it in Acts 1 through 12. It takes about a half an hour to read those unless you're a fast reader. Or you can take three minutes to read one of those chapters. So I would suggest you write down Acts 1 through 12 and you look at it this week and watch what God does with him next. You'll see that the impressive Peter, or impulsive Peter, in the four Gospels becomes the Holy Spirit embodied apostle of Acts 1 through 12 and later 1 and 2 Peter. And so we watch as God takes the impulsivity of Peter and he turns it into this incredible person who's still impulsive, but now he's impulsive with the Gospel and sharing it with people. So much so that numerous people will come to know Christ. Paul briefly mentions Cephas four times in 1 Corinthians and in Galatians. And he has a momentary lapse in hypocrisy in 2.11 through 14. That's where Paul corrects him. And he's like, hey, quit giving all your time to the Jews. Also pay attention to the Gentiles. God's gospel is for everyone. What Christ did on the cross is for everyone. And Peter accepts that rebuke and says, you're right. And he steps into being a full apostle. The two apostles highly excuse me, respected each other and their respective ministries. And so they end up doing ministry together, even though they're in different places, but they're in agreement with each other and what God is doing. Uh, Peter's family, this is really interesting to me. We know his father is Jonah, or also his name is John, who had been named his first son Simon and his second son Andrew. We're going to hear more about Andrew in a minute. That's Peter's brother. We know Simon is married with his mother-in-law. Sometimes he lives with them because Jesus comes and does a miracle on his mother-in-law. Now, I find church hysterical, and I want you to see how funny church can be. The Catholics, as the United Methodists, hold to this incredible belief that from the very beginning, whoever Peter put his hands upon as the first person or the first priest of the church and anoints them to go and preach the gospel, then put their hands on someone else and someone else, and that keeps getting passed on generation to generation so that every Catholic priest can trace their ordination back to Peter and every United Methodist can trace their ordination back to Peter. Now, what I love about this is if you watch the Catholics, you're not allowed to get married, but Peter was married, and I think that's hysterical. And they'll say, oh, a priest can't be married. Well, the first priest was. So, sorry, side note, but put that in your hat because it's funny. That said, Simon's life story really doesn't start earnest until he meets Jesus. So he spends his life learning the same trade as his father. He's a fisherman. But his life doesn't begin until he meets the Son of God, who renames him Cephas, which is translated to Peter in the English, or the rock. And he looks at this man and he sees how shaky his legs are. But instead of seeing that, he sees the potential and he says, you're not a weakling, you're a rock. And Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades won't be able to stand against it. Can you imagine being somebody of kind of, I don't know, unstable faith and having Jesus, the Son of God, say, I'm going to build you into a rock and I'm going to put my church upon you. This consequently is why church gets so screwed up sometimes because Jesus is willing to build it upon regular human beings like Peter and like me and like you. And we're all flawed. Peter's first shows up in Matthew 4, 18 through 20, when Jesus calls him to be one of the first disciples. Jesus visits Peter's home. He heals his mother-in-law. Peter officially becomes one of the 12 apostles in Matthew. And Peter finally starts talking in Matthew 14. So it's 14 chapters before we really hear this guy speak. And he talks only to yell for help when he begins drowning, when he steps out of the boat to go meet Jesus as Jesus is walking across the water to the disciples. A page later, Peter asks Jesus to explain what he's just said. 
because Peter doesn't understand everything that Jesus is explaining. So if you've ever read the Bible and said, I don't get it, guess what? You're in good company because even Peter struggled with it. A chapter later, Peter makes this confession. Okay, I'm starting to get it. You, Jesus, are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the one that's been prophesied from the very beginning. And he starts to, you know, come into this incredible understanding only to fall short. Only a half a dozen verses later, Peter rebukes Jesus for claiming that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life, right? Jesus was born to die. That we needed a perfect lamb, a sacrifice that lived in absolute perfection, lining up perfectly with the will and nature of God and being 100% God and 100% human could then go give his own life as a perfect sacrifice so that when he died, death couldn't hold him. He would have to resurrect. And in resurrecting from the grave, he then sets free all sinners from the grave that no longer you or I or anyone else is condemned to death. We now have life in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is saying, Peter, this has to happen. And Peter's like, No, Lord, I'll protect you. And Jesus goes, Peter, you can't do this. I have to do this. And so he rebukes him. Peter enters this inner circle with James and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's where Jesus begins to light up with the glory of God. And all of a sudden, they recognize that he is, in fact, the Son of God, God in flesh or God incarnate. And Peter looks around, and he he sees these visions of, of Moses and Elijah, and he goes, I know, uh, let me build a tent for you guys and we can all hang out in it. And again, Jesus goes, Peter, it's not about what you can do. It's about what I'm doing. And I want you to see that I'm in the company of the great people that the Jews have followed for centuries, looking forward to what the coming Messiah would be like. Moses was an example of what's to come. Elijah, an example of what's to come. I am what is to come. And so Peter is again being taught, just like you and I, who Jesus is. Later in that chapter, Jesus quizzes Peter. Who gives one or two word answers on the questions of whatever the king's children are exempt from taxes? Jesus is questioning Peter. Look, I know we're supposed to pay temple taxes, but do children pay taxes when their dad is the king? Peter says, well, of course not. And Jesus is alluding to it. Should I pay taxes since my dad is the king? And then Jesus says, but so we don't disturb those that have trouble with that. Go fishing. The first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you'll find a coin in there, and that will pay our temple tax. Jesus is constantly doing miracles around Peter to remind him that he is God. Peter goes silent until Matthew 26, when he's not so humbly claims that he would never fall away or deny Christ, right? I'll never, ever fall short, God. He goes silent again in Matthew 26, and he falls asleep while Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he heads into the last week of Passion where he will, in fact, give his life. And Peter had one job, stay awake and pray. And he couldn't do it because he's human like you and I. And even though he's willing, he's weak, like I can be at times. Mark's gospel is the shortest. But still, he mentions Peter's name as the leader of the early disciples. He's also the leader of the inner circle of the three disciples and the inner circle of the four disciples and even the 12 apostles. So in other words, he's the leader of the church that everyone looks to. And I don't know if it's just because of his age, his personality, or maybe it's because Jesus said, you're the rock. I don't know. But he's a leader. Whether he wants to be or not, God has chosen him and they see him as that. In addition, Mark quotes a couple of people, uh, Peter's one-liners to Jesus where Peter declares, we've left it all for you, Lord. We are all in, but man, he falls short. And in Mark eleven twenty one, he recognizes when Jesus curses the fig tree as an example of what's happened when people turn their back and they no longer look for the Messiah. The curse is already upon them. Luke's gospel is the longest. He alone records the dramatic story of Jesus providing a miraculous catch of fish after Peter had caught nothing all night. And this becomes Peter's testimony. I was sitting there doing what I've always been taught to do since I've been a little boy. I've been trying to fish, and I've done a horrible job that day, and all of a sudden this teacher shows up on the beach, and he says, throw your net on the other side, and I do, and I catch so much fish, my boat almost sinks. And all of a sudden he realizes if nature follows the command of this person, maybe he should too, that maybe he is the Son of God. Luke quotes a few of Peter's one-liners to Jesus in Luke 8. 45 and Luke 12 41 and Luke 18 28. Luke notes that Jesus asked Peter and John to make preparations for the Last Supper 
And near the end of that supper, Luke adds Jesus' words to Peter about returning to him. As well as Luke says, Jesus looks straight at Peter right after his third denial. In addition, Luke's gospel has a verse about Peter going to the empty tomb, discussed in more detail, and John will get to that. Finally, Luke adds Jesus' post-resurrection appearance to Peter. And so Peter is this prominent figure that not only gets to experience Christ's ministry, but he experiences his death and his resurrection and Christ coming back. And so when Peter is explaining in the New Testament letters about how he has experienced the living Jesus in Acts and First and Second Peter, he's not making it up. He's giving a first-hand account. That's pretty cool. Now, in John, Andrew introduces his brother. Andrew is Peter's brother, and he's following John the Baptist. And one day he's following John, and Jesus shows up, and John goes, Listen, this is the guy to follow. I'm not even fit to tie his sandals. Andrew, you would do a better service to yourself if you quit following me and you followed the true Son of God. And so Andrew begins following Jesus. And then he comes home and he says, Peter, I met this guy that's outrageous. You've got to come and meet him. He has things that are filling my life with meaning and purpose. I think he's the Messiah. And so Peter gets to know Jesus that way before Jesus comes and calls Peter to be a disciple. After Jesus' hardest sermon, many leave. And Jesus turns to the twelve and he asks if they want to leave as well. And Peter stands up as a leader and replies, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You've come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. And so Peter is recognizing him as something more than just a rabbi, but the Son of God. When Jesus washes the disciples' feet, Peter objects to the Lord and he rebukes him. Hey, Jesus, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus says, no, no, the Son of God has come to serve. If you can't get on board with that, Peter, then you're not worthy of the gift I'm bringing you of salvation. It's an incredible lesson and a humbling lesson that you and I have to rely on what Christ did, not what we do. That same evening, Peter motions for John to ask Jesus a very important question. A few minutes later, Peter asks Jesus two more questions. John identifies Peter as the disciple in the Garden of Gethsemane who cut off a man's ear, and I love that story. Peter brings a sword, and as this group comes forward, he swings and he cuts off one of the servant's ears, and and everyone says, oh, he's a swordsman, a master. No, he's not. He was going for the guy's head and missed. And Jesus picks up his ear, puts it back on, and heals the man because Jesus isn't about violence. That's not who our God is. And so as a side note, when you see people in this world doing violent acts in the name of Jesus like blowing up an abortion clinic or protesting and harming people, you know that's not Christ. John identifies Peter as the disciple in the Garden of Gethsemane who cuts off the man's ear. John adds a bonus chapter about fishing with Peter, having breakfast with Peter and Jesus, and Jesus talking about their differing futures. And we are going to get into that today. It's my favorite story. All right, now Peter's experience of God's grace, we have to understand this if we're going to better understand the story that's to come. And so when we think about God's grace and just how large it is and how to frame it in the context of the world and this life we live and what God has offered us in salvation, it's hard to wrap our heads around. And it was hard for Peter too. You can read commentary accounts of Peter's three denials. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this is the three times he denied Christ. When Christ was taken from the Garden of Gethsemane and marched into the city, he was taken before the council of the elders, and then he was taken before Pilate. And he was basically put on trial for things that he didn't do, but they wanted to show everybody that he is not the Son of God when in fact he was the Son of God. And in doing so, Peter is standing outside and a young girl comes to him and says, hey, aren't you with that guy Jesus? And he says, no. And another woman will ask and he says, no. And another person will ask and he'll say, no. And then the the rooster will crow and he'll remember what Jesus said at the Passover dinner where he said, Peter, as much as you love me, you're going to end up denying me three times. And at that moment, is that same moment every Christian has felt. That moment where we know that what we have done or what we're doing is against the will and nature and character of God. And we feel ashamed. Peter felt that shame. And he didn't know what to do with it. As Peter discovered, we can rest assured that no matter how often we let God down, Jesus demonstrates how God won't give up on us. That's a lesson Peter's going to learn while he's struggling in that shame. Life is not like a game of baseball where three strikes you're out. God's kingdom operates on an entirely different basis. The truth is that we all have failed God and fallen short of his holy standards. But God didn't come to judge the world without first coming to redeem it, and that's so critical, right? God isn't standing up on a cloud looking down trying to catch you doing wrong. God sees the world in its state. He knows it's fallen, 
We read about that in Genesis chapter 3. He knows the world is in need of a Savior, and it's in need of being put back into the way it was designed to be. And so he offers that through his son Jesus. God's grace is too big, and his love for us is too great to simply let us go astray. So like Peter, we have an opportunity to experience God's love and grace by recognizing and owning up to our inability to live up to God's kingdom standards. Everything Christ lays out for us, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New, is the new standard for kingdom living when we come into God's presence. This is the bar. And we recognize that we can't always make that bar. And that's where Christ fills the gap and he comes in and he says, I'm going to offer a way. Not only can you look at my life and how I lived and see it as an example, but now I'm going to offer that very life for you. So that when God looks at you, he doesn't see your failures and shortcomings. Instead, he sees me, the substitutionary lamb, standing before, saying, I've given my life for this person. God, they're okay. And redemption begins in our hearts and our lives. Like Peter, we have an opportunity to experience God's love and grace by recognizing and owning up to our inability to live up to God's kingdom standards. By confessing our shortcomings and asking for his forgiveness, God's grace will be enough to put us back in the game. And I love that part. And that's a big point of what's going to happen next. Now, no one understood this better than Peter, for in a single evening, Peter denies his closest friend, Jesus Christ, three times. First to a maid, then to a couple of co-workers, then to an entire group of bystanders. Yet after his resurrection, Jesus made a point of repeatedly reassuring Peter that he still had great things in store for, a very, for this very human and less than perfect disciple. And so Jesus doesn't give up, even in those hardest of times. Now, the question we're going to ask is, what is love? And so I've prepared this song just for you. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me no more. Now, you've seen these slogans all over, love is love. And, and I'm just going to tell you, it, it's a bunch of crap, and here's why. We, we love the idea of love is love, but, but here's the problem, and especially in English. When I say, boy, I love my wife, and I love my truck, hopefully no one's going, boy, that guy's romantic with his wife and his truck, weird. But in Greek, they have multiple words. And so as they're saying the word love, they're actually using a specific word for each one. And so people can fully understand what they're saying. Here in American English, we have to listen to the whole context of the sentence. And we have to put some things into it to say, okay, I think I understand what they're saying. But it gets really confusing. And so in our world, we do this, right? We say, well, love is love. And so, boy, if you like someone, you, sh you should just immediately sleep with them and be with them. And, and, and that just shows your love. Well, that's not really love. It may be a part of it, but it's not really love. And so we have to be really careful. And so this next thing I want to show you before we get to our great story is now that you know who Peter is, we're now going to look at these four words that are really important. They're words that are used in the New Testament and inferred in the New Testament. And they have significant meaning for where we're going next. So let's jump into this. The first one is phileho or phileho. Okay, this is a Greek word for love. But what it means is the love between close friends or brothers. It shows a personal attachment and has more to do with a person's feelings and emotions. This word often appears as brotherly love in the New Testament. And here are some places you can look it up. But we know this word as in the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. So these words still have meaning in our culture today. But when we use the word phileo, we're saying, man, I love you like a brother, like a sister. You're, you're just that really close friend. You're special to me. Now there's eros. Eros refers to the love found in romantic relationship. This is where we get the word erotic from, another word you see in our culture today. This is passion and intimacy. It, it's connected to our idea of falling in love and being in love. And while the Greek word eros doesn't necessarily appear specifically in the New Testament, the idea is included in passages like Hebrews 13.4, when the writer refers to marriage, the marriage bed, as marriage is, an honor, is honorable among us, among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. In other words, don't cheat on your spouse. But what's interesting here is because that word's not used doesn't mean it wasn't used in the culture at that time. And so when these words are being used, everyone goes, oh, yep, that's eros. He's talking about erotic love here. And they get it, stoge. Stoge refers to the love between family members. So this is like a, a mother, a father to, to the children, close enough to be considered family. Stoge is a protective love that can withstand hardships and trials. This is like the family unit coming together. This is why we talk about church and them all being a family. It's 
an interesting word. It's like eros. The word stoge doesn't appear in the New Testament. However, the opposite form of it does. It's used twice in the New Testament. It's found in Romans 131, 2 Timothy 3.3, 3, and translated as unloving or my favorite heartless. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? But these words are important to know. Now, it's hard to always remember these words, so maybe this will help you. If you're familiar Johnny, with this movie, you for you, Uncle Lewis? that's Christmas Vacation, and he's dealing with his uncle who is just a pain in the butt, but he loves him because he's a family member. So think Stogie, family love. Got it. Agape. Now, this is the most important one and probably the most powerful one. It's the one that signifies not only how we're to love, but the actual character and nature of God. This is when we say God is love, we're talking about agape, and this is what it means. It's unconditional, sacrificial love. It biblically refers to a love that God is, as in his character and nature, how he acts, and how he shows love. Agape is a love of choice. It's a love that serves others with humility. It is selfless love, the highest form of the four loves that we consider. So when we say love is love, this is why I struggle with it. It's so easy to be young in love and go, oh, I just love this person. They're so great. But as a pastor, what's amazing to me is when I'm sitting in the hospital with a family where the spouse is dying, and the other spouse has been there every night for the last month, sacrificing everything they have to be with that person. That's love, when they could have left. We know what sacrificial love is, and we realize that love is a choice. It's not just a feeling or an emotion that can easily be switched on and off depending on our mood or circumstance or how things are going. But love is a choice. That's why when people stand at the altar and they say, I am going to marry this person, I'm going into a covenant, and we take vows and we think about those vows as some days I'm not going to love you, but I'm going to choose to. Because even though I don't always feel it, I know it's part of my responsibility as a creation made in the image of God to love you the way God loves. And so I'm going to be sacrificial in my love. And what's interesting is if we were all to live that way, constantly sacrificing for one another, can you imagine? It'd be perfect, but it's hard to do when we're broken humans. Agape is the kind of love discussed by Paul in the famous love chapter in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 13, and God has demonstrated his agape love for us in Romans that while we were still sinners, he died for us, meaning that Christ chose that. His people are to follow his example and demonstrate that same kind of love to others. Isn't it amazing that God doesn't say, hey, get your act together, and then I'll think about giving my life for you. You know, just get straight and get everything right, and then I might do this. Now, God says, look, I know you're broken. I know, I know you can't get it all figured out, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to provide that for you. I'm going to demonstrate it, show it, and do it. And then I'm going to ask that you would live your life in that same way, that if you truly accept me for who I am and what I'm doing, you'll want to honor that by doing the same. So here we go, 1 Corinthians. Love is patient, love is kind. This is who God is, not just what he does. It does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud, it does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves, and most importantly, love never fails. You've probably heard this read at wedding ceremonies. But it's really not about a husband and wife or two people coming together. It's about the character and nature of God. In Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his own love for us that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. So here they are again, just so you remember them. Phileo, brotherly love like Philadelphia. Eros, erotic or romantic love. Stoge, get my stoge. It's family love. And agape, unconditional sacrificial love. Now, let's get into our story. I love the way John ends his gospel. Jesus has now died, resurrected. He's already revealed himself to Mary Magdalene. He showed himself to some of the disciples. He's let uh, Thomas put his hands in his wounds to actually feel that he really is Jesus, even though he has doubts. And now he's going to appear to Peter and the disciples while they're out fishing. And what I love about this story is Peter and the disciples are like, well, he died. We don't know what to do. Let's go back to what we know. Let's go fishing. And funny enough, Peter finds himself in a very familiar situation, just like when he first met Jesus. He's fishing, and he's not catching anything. But all of a sudden, Jesus shows up on the beach, and he says, hey, cast your net on the other side. And in the same way John ends this story, he shares the story of Jesus showing up in his resurrected form, and he calls out to the disciples in the boat, and he says, hey, how's it going? Catch anything yet? Now, I'm sure they couldn't see who he was, and I'm sure there were things they said that John wouldn't write down, like, who's this clown, and 
probably some obscenities, you know. But what's fascinating is Jesus then yells, cast your net on the other side. And I'm sure there was a moment where they looked at each other and said, who's this idiot? What is, he doesn't know anything about fishing. But they decide to do it, and as they do it, again, they catch so much fish, they can barely haul it in. At that moment, Peter realizes it's Jesus. Now, he's taken off his outer garment because it's probably hot working on the boat. So he's standing in his undergarment, which is still covering his body, but it's sort of like underwear. And he grabs his garment, ties it around his waist, and he jumps out of the boat because he can't wait for these guys to bring the fish in and drive the boat in. He's got to get to Jesus first. And he swims like hell, and he's trying to get all the way to the shore. And as he gets there, there is Jesus sitting on the shore, and he already has a fire going, fish on top of it, a loaf of bread. And he says, Peter, you want to have some breakfast? Well, by the time Peter gets to shore, the boat has already collected all the fish, and they're right behind him. I mean, probably got there at the same time. And Jesus says, bring some of the fish from the catch. And they sit around, and they enjoy being in the presence of Jesus. And then the story takes a turn. Here they are coming in. I love this artist's rendition. Now, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, which is so cool. It's like when you were a kid and you got in trouble and they call you by your full name. He's just making a point to say, Simon, son of John, you know who I'm talking to. It's you. You're not in trouble. But I want you to know I see you. I know you. I know who you are. I know your past. I know your present. And I'm about to tell you your future. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love? And that word love in English is actually... Agape. Now, agape is that selfless form of love that is that full image of God. The love in which God chooses to have for us even when we don't choose to love him back. It's a self-sacrificial love. It, it's the highest form of love there is. Peter, do you love me beyond condition with everything you are? Are you willing to meet me where I'm at and give your life for me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. Isn't that interesting? If you read the English, it says love. But what he's really saying is, I love you like a brother, man. You know we're connected. You know it's a deep love. I mean, you're like my BFF. But Jesus is saying, Peter, again, you missed it. He said to him, feed my lambs, which is this really cool term for sheep and lambs. You're going to see this go back and forth. But lambs are like little babies. They're sheep that are less than a year old. They require a special kind of care and, and maintenance to keep those things alive. And so he's saying, Peter, I'm about to turn you loose in the world as an apostle that's going to share the gospel of peace, hope, and truth. As you do so, pay attention to the young in faith and the young in life. Make sure you mentor them and, and care for them and love them and meet them where they're at and allow them to grow in that first year so that they can become mature sheep. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love agape me? Choose me without condition. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. Again, Peter, whoosh, right over his head. He's missing it. He says, tend my sheep. All right, you're going to take care of the young ones in faith. Now, those ones that have been here all along, can you help them rise to the next level? Can you see the potential in their own life? Can you see past their shortcomings and failures in the same way I see past yours? In the same way I call you a rock, can you see them as rocks? Strong in faith. And Peter says, yep. So he says, Simon, son of John, do you love phileo me? And Peter is now grieved. He's like, Jesus, I've been answering this question all morning. You know that I love you like a brother. Now, but check this out. This is so cool. What does Jesus do this time with the word love? He doesn't say agape. He says phileo. All right, Peter, can you rise above and love me in the same way that I am? And Peter's like, sure can. And Jesus goes, no, nope, you missed it. Peter. Can you love me in the way that I am? Can you self-sacrifice the way that I can? And Peter's like, yes, I love you like a brother. <whistles> Missed it. And then Jesus says, all right, Peter, you love me like a brother. In other words, I'll, I'll meet you where you're at because I don't see the person who's lacking faith. I see the rock, and we're going to get there. Peter's grieved. The Lord says, look, feed my sheep. Take care of the lambs. Tend them. Feed them. Tell them about me because everyone, deserves a church home. Jesus comes down to meet us where we are, just like he comes down to meet Peter. He invites us to experience the love and the grace of the Father through the life, death, and resurrection. He becomes more than just friends of God. We become family and people worthy of redemption. You are worthy of redemption. All are given the invitation to step into God's love. And we ask, well, how can we do that? John says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, Peter. 
But now as you get old, you're going to stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And he said this to show what kind of death would happen to Peter that would glorify God. So in other words, he begins telling Peter, look, I have a mission for you to go and share the gospel. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep, go into the world. And Peter, you're going to have a long life. You're going to have lots of time to do this, but I'm turning you loose. And Peter does something so remarkable. It brings the same shame back in my own life when I think about it. He looks at Peter, or Peter looks at Jesus, and he looks and he sees John behind him, and he says, hmm, what's going to happen to that guy? And all of a sudden, he's looking at someone else's life and comparing it to his own. Do you ever do that? As, as Christians, we often do this. We'll go, oh, that person's so spiritual. If I could just be like them, right? Or if you ever, oh my God, dabble in Facebook. Everyone has this perfect life. Or Pinterest, all their houses are immaculate. I think everyone on Pinterest doesn't have kids. I'm like, obviously. But Peter's first inkling is to look at John and say, well, what about that guy? And Peter says, listen, if I want to keep him alive until I return, what's that to you? You have one job. Follow me. Follow me. He says it twice. When I think about all the things going on right now in my life with, with my kids and my marriage and this church moving, and I just think, boy, it's overwhelming. But then I think, I have one job. Follow me. Jesus. You have one job. Follow Jesus. And he's going to take care of the rest. The kingdom of God is not like the game of baseball where three strikes and you're out. In fact, I love this. This is uh, Colonel Hal Moore. And you would know him from the movie um, We Were Soldiers, which Mel Gibson plays him in the movie. He says, three strikes and you're not out. There's always one more thing you can do, right? In God's kingdom, three strikes and you're not out. There's always one more thing you can do. God's kingdom operates on an entirely different basis than the game of baseball. Thank God. The truth is that we all have fall, failed God and fallen short of his holy standards. But God didn't come to judge the world without first coming to redeem it. Right? Here's the gift. Step into it. If you don't want it and you don't accept it, then we'll deal with the other part. But first know that I love you. I want you. Come join me. God's grace is too big and his love for us is too great to simply let us go astray. So like Peter, we have an opportunity to experience God's love and grace by recognizing and owning up to our inability to live up to God's kingdom standards. And we do that by confessing our shortcomings, asking for forgiveness, and God's grace will be enough to put us back in the game like Peter. After his resurrection, Jesus made a point to repeatedly reassure Peter that he still had great things in store for the very human and less than perfect disciple. Now, if you were to jump ahead and to read into Acts, something amazing happens at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes and descends upon the apostles, and Peter steps out into Jerusalem, which is now swelled with people, probably close to two million people. And he begins preaching the gospel, his testimony of Jesus. Here's how I know Jesus, and here is who he is. And as he does, the Holy Spirit begins working through him so that his words are heard by every ear in their own language. And that very day, 3,000 people will come to know Christ. That's 1,000 for every time Peter denied Christ. Do you see how redemption works in the kingdom of God? He wants to take whatever shortcoming you and I have, whatever inability we have to believe, whatever we lack, and he wants to redeem it a thousand full. This is why you and I can stick to the one task at hand, which is follow Jesus. Later in his life, Peter's going to look back on this experience with Jesus and he's going to be reminded. And he's going to share with his fellow Christians that Jesus personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, we've been healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you've turned to the shepherd, the guardian of your souls. You don't come up with those words unless you've walked the walk and experienced the shame and found redemption. As Peter discovered, it's not too late for you and me to return to Jesus Christ today. Confess your sins, ask for forgiveness, and receive a second chance. And this is how we do it. It's so simple. Lord Jesus, I have fallen short. I want so badly to have the faith that you offer us. I want to trust that you are God. Would you come and help make that known in my life? Forgive me for the ways I haven't lived up to your kingdom, and come and make me new. Give me the hope and strength. Let me become a rock. Let me follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.